Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. Got a Bible? You can open your Bible with me this morning to Psalms chapter number 103. Psalms chapter number 103. If you do not have a Bible, uh, there's a black hardback Bible located in a seat rack around you, uh, below you, in front of you. Page 470 is going to take you right to Psalms 103. So we're going to take the thinking out of it for you. 470, you can get right to it. Uh, we take the Word of God pretty seriously here, and we're going to open it together as we study this uh, in our group study this morning together through Psalm 103 as we continue going in our summer in the Psalms. We're taking different Psalms this summer, and we're unpacking, unpacking them each week, and we're looking forward to seeing what God does for us in our time in the Word as we take our summer in the Psalms. And last week we began in 103, and we're going to continue in 103 this morning. And so if you have a Bible or if you don't, grab one of those black hardback Bibles. And let me say this, if you do not own a Bible, let that black hardback Bible be our gift to you. Take that home with you. You do not have to borrow it. You do not have to steal it, okay? It's a gift. We're giving it to you as a free gift for you to have. Uh, but page 470 is going to get you right to 103 this morning. We're going to be in verses 6 down to verse number 14. Uh, we understand that the book of Psalms was uh, a book in the Old Testament that was used by the children of Israel as their songbook. Much of you, maybe you were uh, raised in church and you had the old hymn books that would be kept in the pews and you'd open those up and you would sing those songs uh, in your Sunday gatherings. Well, the book of Psalms would have been their songbook that they used to open up and to uh, sing in their worship. And they are inspired lyrics inspired lyrics that God gave for the people of God in the Old Covenant. Now, we are the followers of God, followers of Jesus in the New Covenant. Now, we have the privilege of looking at these psalms and learning from them and, and unpacking these and seeing what God has for us in his Bible for us. As we learned last week, as we began 103, we learned that you don't have to dig deep into psalms to see the goodness of God. The attributes of God, the, the faithfulness of God, and the goodness of God is sitting right on top of every chapter in the book of Psalms. We understand you don't got to be a good fisherman to find these fish or these gold nuggets. You don't got to be a good theologian to see them. They're sitting there right for you to grasp on. They're right on the surface level in each chapter of the book of Psalms. As we said already, we began verse one, chapter 103 last Sunday, and we learned of the goodness of God. And David is speaking to himself. Uh, David is reminding himself. David is preaching to himself in verse number one of chapter 103. And he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And David here is saying, soul, bless the Lord. And David is prodding himself. David is speaking to himself. David is motivating himself to remember the Lord's benefits. He's saying, soul, Remember his benefits. Soul, speak of his wonders. Soul, tell of his greatness. And he gives us six uh, different truths about the goodness of God that we titled it last week. And in uh, chapter, chapter uh, verse number two, he begins with saying, I'm a beneficiary. I get all the benefits of God. I'm the beneficiary. God is the benefactor. When I become one of God's covenant children, when I place faith in Christ, when I come into this relationship with God through Christ, I am now a beneficiary of God's goodness on my life. And then in chapter, in verse number two, he says, I've been forgiven of my sins. In verse number three, rather, he forgives all my iniquities, not just some of them, but all my iniquities. And David is saying, soul, bless the Lord. Be reminded of God's goodness in your life. And then in verse number three, he also says, I'm a recipient of God's miracles. He heals all my diseases. God is a miracle working God. God is a God that heals infirmities. God is a God that heals diseases of his covenant children. And we understand if that disease is not healed on this earth, that there is coming a day where all tears will be wiped away, where there'll be no more sickness, no more pain, no more death in the new heaven, new earth for all of eternity, where forever the miraculous work of God's healing touch on us will be fully on display. And then we see in verse number four, it says, I've been purchased out of bondage. 
He says, man, I've been, I've been redeemed from the pit in verse number four. David wanted to remind himself, I was in the pit. I was down in the depravity of my sin. Ephesians chapter two, one to three. I was lost in my sin. I was lost in my darkness. I had no desire for God. I was dead, but God lowered down the rope of his grace down to the bottom of the pit and pulled me out of the pit. He's redeemed me. He has purchased me from the slave market of sin. He's saying, soul, rejoice. And then we learned last Sunday, last Sunday as well in verse number four, I've been crowned. I've been crowned with, with his grace and his mercy. We got a royal crown. It's better than a Burger King crown, we said last Sunday, right? It is a royal crown that God has given to his covenant children. We are loved. The title of God upon your life is you are loved with his grace and with his mercy. And then he concludes in verse number five, and he says, he fully satisfies, full satisfaction is available to me in God, in a relationship with Christ, uh, through Christ, with your heavenly father, there is full satisfaction available to you. And David stopped in verse, in chapter 103, and he said, soul, wake up, soul, rejoice, soul, remember the goodness of God. Today, we're going to continue in chapter 103, and we're going to unpack verses 6 down to verse number 14 of chapter 103. What motivates you right now? What is motivating you? Every one of us have motivations for why we do what we do, right? And every one of us have a lack of motivation for why we don't, things that, why we don't do the things we should do, right? Right? For instance, my daughters are motivated to do tasks that are signed by me because when they fulfill those tasks in a timely manner, they get allowances, they get money. Money talks, right? Even for a five-year-old, money talks. Money motivates even at the youngest age. Uh, often, uh, um, uh, as we get older, we begin to not be able to even look at food like we once did without putting on weight. Like you just look at a cheeseburger, you immediately put on weight, right? Right? And after a while, you're motivated to say, I'm going to stop eating cheeseburgers because I'm tired of looking at myself in the mirror this way. I'm tired of unbuttoning the top button of my pants every time I sit down because I'm in excruciating pain and it feels like my organs are going to pop out of my body, right? Like we're motivated to not eat the cheeseburger no more because we no longer want to have that cheeseburger feeling inside of our belly anymore, right? Like our motivations change over, over time. You know, motivations change at different years of life. I think about as a child, you know, you're motivated to not get in trouble because you don't want to take a nap. Like you're not, I mean, nap for a kid is like purgatory. It's like the worst thing possible that could happen. But when you're an adult, that motivation don't work no more. Like nap's a gift from God, right? Like you cannot motivate an adult, behave adult, or you're going to have to take a nap. It's like, that's a gift for me to take a nap. Motivations change. Motivations are real. Why are motivations a big deal? Because motivations fuel our actions. Motivations fuel our actions. And in ch uh, ch chapter 103 of uh, verses 6 down to 14, David is reminding himself of the motivations to praise God with his life. David is listing reasons why God deserves praise from our lives. So you may be here today and you're extremely motivated to praise God with your life right now. Or you may be here today and, and you feel a sense of apathy towards praising God with your life. Like there's a lack of motivation for you to praise God with your life. Whatever the case is, the spirit of God is speaking through David, reminding us of the motivation to praise God with our life because he is worthy of our praise, amen? With that thought over our head, let's read it together. Chapter 103 of Psalms. Psalm 103, beginning in verse 6 down to verse 14. And as we read this, remember this is God's word for us, written through David by the Spirit of God, inspired, preserved, and kept for us, and has all authority. So let's give it the attention it deserves, beginning in verse 6. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. 
As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. The big idea sitting over the verses that we're going to unpack this morning together is this right here. God cares for me. God's care for me fuels my praise for him. Jot it down. God's care for me fuels my praise for him. See, here's what we know to be true, and here's what I believe David knew to be true, is we tend to be more circumstantial than we are biblical in our rejoicing and praise. We become more circumstantial We become more circumstantially motivated to praise more than we are theologically motivated to praise. We don't know the circumstances going on in David's life right here as he writes this. We do not know the valley he was in. We do not know the situation he was in. But here David begins in 103, not saying he's going to praise and rejoice because his circumstances are good. No, in fact, he's prodding himself as, as, if he's, as, as if, it's as if he's preaching to himself. It's as if he's trying to remind himself, hey, David, get up, snap out of it, soul, start rejoicing, be reminded. It doesn't matter about your circumstances. It, it, your praise is connected to the theolo- theology of God. God that influences and fuels your praise. So right out of the gate, he's not talking about his circumstances fueling his praise, but all he's unpacking for us is the theology of God. This is who God is, and the reality of who God is is my fuel for praising him. So why do we praise God? We praise God because God is good. Who do we praise? We praise God alone through Jesus the Christ. When do we praise? All the time. When we gather and when we scatter, right? How do we praise? With our lungs and with our lives as we live on mission. So this is how we praise. And David here is, is, is prodding himself. Hey, David, soul, wake up, praise God. And he's reminding himself of theological nuggets of truth that are motivating factors to push him, to fuel him to praise God with his life. So the question we're gonna simply ask is this. If God's care for me fuels my praise for him, then what must we remember about God if our praise is going to be fueled? Like if the idea is if, if God's care for me fuels my praise for him, then what do we got to remember about God if our praise is going to be fueled? And David gives us three of them that we want to unpack this morning, and I believe they'll be helpful under the, under the Spirit of God's help as we jot them down and talk to them this morning through these verses. Three reminders if our praise is going to be fueled for him. We're going to do it this way. My praise is fueled by remembering. My praise is fueled by remembering. Three statements. Let's do this together. Are y'all ready? One person's ready. Are we all ready? We're not moving forward until you say you're ready, all right? We'll just have a staring contest, all right? Are we ready? All right. My praise is fueled by remembering, number one, God cares for the hurting. God cares for the hurting. He says right here in verse 6, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. My praise is fueled by remembering God cares for the hurting. In verse 6, you ought to have the word Lord in all capitalized letters. If your translation of the Bible does not have it in all caps, they're either italicized or have some comment next to it. And the reason it is there is because it is the the Hebrew word Yahweh for Lord. It's God's covenant name. It's God's covenant name that he gave to his covenant people. The first time God gave this name was in Exodus chapter 34, verse number six, where God gave this covenant name to God's covenant children in the old covenant, which were the children of Israel, and he gives it to Moses in Exodus 34, verse number six. So the Lord is in all caps so that we would know the name being translated from the Hebrew language that we'd understand the meaning of this word. The covenant name of God, the name that God gave for himself for those that have a covenant relationship with him. Now, this is not the name of God for creator and creation, but is the name of God for those who have a covenant relationship with God. Now, in David's day, he was in the old covenant, meaning that that in the old covenant, they had faith that a Messiah would come, an anointed one would come that would take away the sins of the world. 
In the new covenant, the Messiah has already come. He was Jesus the Christ. Christ, the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. He is the anointed one. And those that have faith in the Christ are now in the new covenant relationship with Yahweh. And so right here, he wants us to see that this is the name of God for his covenant children. And so as David is declaring these theological truths, he is writing them in reference to those who are in a covenant relationship with God. Those that have placed faith in the Christ. Old covenant, they had faith that a Messiah would come. Us in the new covenant, we look back and say we understand that Christ has come. We are in this covenant relationship with him. And so here he's, he's giving us covenant truths that Yahweh gives to his covenant children. And it begins with this idea, God cares for the, her- for, for the hurting. He says in verse 6, the Lord works. God is actively working amongst his children, amen? God is actively at working. He works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. It's what David wants us to understand and what David is reminding himself and what the Spirit of God is speaking through David for us this morning, for our learning and our growth, is an understanding that God is on the side of the oppressed. This does not mean that his righteousness and justice on the oppressor of his covenant children will all be done at once, or that there'll never be any delay. This does not mean that his covenant children will not suffer at all. The meaning is that God holds the oppressed near to his heart. And at the proper time, God's acts will be in favor for those who are oppressed. Sooner or later, God will step in on behalf of the oppressed and vindicate their cause. You know, we live in a hostile world where, there is, where, where oppression is real. We've seen oppression in, in biblical history. We've seen oppression of God's people in world history. We've seen it in evil governments. We've seen it in slavery in our country. We've seen it in, in genocide of other countries. We've seen it in unrighteous decisions and and dealings of those in law and those in courts. We've seen it in, in all different shapes and sizes because wicked and prideful humans are ruling and the oppression is real. Oppression happens every day on micro levels and macro levels. But whatever level it is on, God is on the side of the oppressed. And the oppressor of evil will not go unmatched by God's righteous judgment. God cares for the hurting. And that's why he goes into verse number seven and he gives us an Old Testament illustration, an Old Testament historical event that proves that God cares for the oppressed. Let's see it in verse seven. He made known his ways to Moses, his Acts. He's actively working amongst his covenant people to the people of Israel. So David here in verse seven points us to the work of God among his people, the children of Israel. You can read about the works of God amongst his children in Exodus chapter number one, all the way to chapter number 14. And in those 14 chapters, you're going to read about the children of Israel being brought into slavery in Egypt, God sending the plagues upon Pharaoh and all the armies of Egypt, and that, that in that moment that God began to, to free his people after the great battle happened and Moses led them out of, out of slavery and he stands up and he says, let my people go. And, and, and they're released from that bondage. God, in miraculous ways, after plagues and intervening, frees his people from the oppression and the slavery of the wicked leadership of Pharaoh and the Egyptian government. And we see God step in and release those that are under the oppression. And may we just be encouraged this morning that no matter what oppression or opposition you may be facing or you will face, you know this, that God cares and that God's righteousness and justice will prevail. It may seem today like evil is prevailing. It may seem like oppression is prevailing. It may seem like evil is getting more popular, greater followings, getting louder with their voices. They're getting more dominant. But may we be reminded that God is on the throne, that God is aware of everything that's going on, that God cares, God sees, God's aware, and one day his righteousness and his judgment will vindicate those that are being oppressed. We can celebrate that truth this morning, and we can pray. Praise him for that this morning, that God cares for the hurting. 
Let me just give you a side application here. Listen, if God's heart is for the hurting, then may God's heart be our heart as well. If God's heart is for the oppressed, then may we speak up and speak out as well. All the way from the womb, all the way to the tomb. Life is sacred, life is meaningful, and life is special. May we be his hands and feet in our community. May we care for the hurting like God cares for the hurting. So God cares, God's care for me fuels my praise for him. We said, first of all, my praise is fueled by remembering God cares for the hurting. I want to give you the second one. We good? Number two, my praise is fueled by remembering God has infinite love for the lost. God has infinite love for the lost. I want you to see this because this is amazing truth and amazing words as they pop off of the text to us. He says it like this in verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. My praise is fueled because, by remembering God has infinite love for the lost. Let's break this down together. He says it like this in verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Merciful. We don't get what we deserve. Gracious. Giving us what we don't deserve. One, uh, many writers have said it this way. God's mercy is his grace on full display. God is not quick-tempered or reactionary. If he was, there would be no hope for any of us in this room this morning. Amen. God abounds in enduring, unceasing, relentless love for his children. And then in verse 9, he says, he will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. I know many of you know what that word chide is. I read that word, I think of a chai latte or whatever those things are called, right? That's just immediately where my mind goes, like a, some fancy coffee or tea or something like that. It's not a fancy coffee or tea, okay? The word chide. It's not a word we use often. You're not going to talk this way tomorrow, probably. Chide is a legal term. It's a legal term meaning accuse. What is he saying here? God drops the lawsuit against you. Not because there wasn't enough evidence. It's because it was settled out of court by the shedding of the blood of his only begotten son of Jesus Christ. If our sentence was handed, was handled in the God's courtroom, the evidence to convict us is endless. And the punishment is eternal separation under the full wrath of God. Because of Christ, we now are under no condemnation, Romans chapter 8, verse number 1. The lawsuit has been dropped, not because you had a good enough attorney and not because there was no evidence. The lawsuit was dropped because Jesus took the charges on your behalf. We give God glory for that. And then he continues in verse 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Aren't you glad for that? Just say amen. He does not deal with me according to my sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Thank you, Jesus. He continues in verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. Like the highest words David could think of is as high as the heavens are above the earth. I was reading an article a couple weeks ago about the world's largest telescope, and they're trying to figure out how big space is. And they're believing that space is expanding itself because they keep seeing more and more and more. The problem is, the bigger the telescopes they get, they just can't seem to figure out the end of space. And here, David, before they even knew about about, uh, the light years, and before they even knew about the science we have today, under the inspiration of God and the Spirit of God, he says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. We don't even know where the heavens end above the earth. Praise God, that is a God that has much love for his covenant children. And he continues in verse number 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. East and the west are infinite in their distance. East and west will never meet. They are infinite in their distance. And so David, 
begins and says, as high as David could think of and as far as David could think of, infinite height and infinite distance, God has separated you from your sin. He sees you in the righteousness of Christ. He sees you in perfect obedience of Christ because you've placed your faith in him. He moves your sin that was paid for by his son as far away from you as the east is from the west, as far as it can get, infinite distance. Our sins will never be attached to us again. We will never be accounted for based upon our sins because Jesus has paid for them all. There is no end to his love. There are no limits to his mercy and his grace. Therefore, God's care for me fuels my praise for him. And I'm thankful this morning that God has infinite love for the lost, that God's love does not end for the lost, but that those that come to Christ by faith, believing that he lived the life you could not live, perfection, and that Jesus died the death you deserve to die under the full wrath of God, and that Jesus took your sin upon himself, and in exchange, he gave you back his righteousness. And three days later, Jesus rose from the grave, conquering death and conquering sin. And if you this morning will put your confidence and your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you now will become one of the covenant children of God and a recipient of the benefits of God. He cares for you. He has infinite love for you. No longer will your sins meet you again. You have a clean slate. You're washed white as snow. You have a new life, not because you got good, not because you got religious, not because you got baptized, not because you turned over a new leaf. No, because Jesus Christ paid it for you. And that's available to you this morning. And that's a decision you can make right in your seat this morning, placing that confidence in Jesus the Christ, accepting the free gift of salvation in Jesus. God's care for me fuels my praise for him. Number three this morning, my praise is fueled by remembering God cares for me faithfully and he knows me fully. God cares for me faithfully and he knows me fully. I love these, three, these two verses here, man. Such powerful verses. He says it like this. Verse 13. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. My praise is fueled by remembering God cares for me faithfully and he knows me fully. Let's unpack these two verses. Verse 13, he says it like this. As a father shows compassion to his children. David begins verse 13 with comparing the earthly relationship of a father and a child to our heavenly relationship we have with God the Father. This shows us that God is not some distant deity, but, but God is the father, uh, a father that is very, a very near God who knows and he cares for his children deeply. The word picture here is that of a, a relational caring. And if you're, if you're a parent in this room, there, you have an understanding that, that there's no deeper love and care than a parent for their children, right? Like there's a unique love you have for your, for your child. And I told the first service, like, like I love some of your children, right? But, but not all the children. I love some of your children, right? I love all the children. But there's a unique love. There's a unique love that you have for your children, man. There's a unique love that a father and mother have for their children child. And here he pictures this, this word picture of, of this relational connection to God the Father, of a father and child. And that's why when Jesus was asked by his disciples, how do we pray? How do we pray? And Jesus told his disciples how to pray. He taught them in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9. He says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We have a heavenly Father we can go to. That's why Romans chapter 8 says we can go before him and cry, Abba, Father. Listen, God is not some religious figure or some angry, distant deity. God, if you're in Christ, if you have placed confidence in Christ, if you are one of his covenant children, you can go to your heavenly Father. You are a child going to your Father, and he loves you deeply. Then he continues in verse 13. He says, so the Lord shows compassion. Again, in verse 13, he gives the all caps of the word Lord. That's Yahweh again, God's covenant name. The name God gave himself of his covenant with his people. And David again is saying, uh, reminding himself, and, and the Spirit of God is reminding us through David that God cares for us faithfully. 
that God is a God that not only is our father, but he is a God that cares for us faithfully. The covenant that God gave to us through Jesus cannot be broken. A covenant is a, is a promise that is not based upon us. It's based upon God. And no matter what we do, we cannot get ourselves out of that covenant. It is a promise by God that if you come to Christ by faith, you are adopted in the family of God. Your sins are forgiven. You are declared righteous. You are in his family for all of eternity. The spirit of God indwells you. That is a promise that God holds on to. You aren't holding on to. You aren't holding God in your hand. He's holding you in your hand and he's protecting that covenant. God cares for me faithfully. God's care for you is not based on you. God's care for you is based on the covenant relationship you have with him through faith in Jesus the Christ. There was this thing that came out a few years ago called Facebook, right? You remember that? Anyone know what Facebook is, all right? And it came out. And they didn't have Facebook when I was in high school. They didn't have Facebook when I was in college. And we had phones and we did T9 texting in college. Anyone know what T9 texting is? I asked the first service, some new. T9, that's like, you're, you're old if you know what T9 texting is, okay? We had the flip phones. There was no Facebook or anything like that. And uh, but Facebook came around and, and you were suddenly reminded of, of people you used to have that were friends that you, that you really wanted to forget they were ever your friend. And they popped up now and you began to see their faces of people you used to do life with. And you were reminded like, man, I, I didn't really didn't want to see that person again because I was reminded like what I did with that person, right? And now you're like, how do I hide myself from them? But, but as you see these friends, you're reminded about, about these friends of maybe childhood where, where you thought you are besties for life, man. Like you had the secret handshake, the secret codes. Like you thought, man, we're going to build houses together. We're going we're gonna to raise kids together, right? And that friendship didn't make it out of middle school. That was real good, long friendship. <laughs> what happens? You grow out of each other. You get different hobbies, different interests. You move away. My friend, listen to me. I'm thankful that the relationship we have with God is his covenant children cannot be grown out of. It cannot be broken. It cannot be departed from. He is the one of faithful. Do we change? Do we falter? Are we fickle? Yes, God doesn't change. God doesn't falter. God isn't fickle. It's his covenant promise. Therefore, we are his covenant children and he's holding on to it. He is faithful and is caring for us. Then he continues in verse 13. So the Lord shows compassion. Aren't you glad that he shows compassion? He's our Yahweh. He's faithful, but he shows compassion. God cares for me tenderly. The word compassion there could be the word pity. We're messed up. We're messed up. We have a problem. And he looks upon us and he shows us pity. He shows us compassion. He's tender to us. He shows compassion to us. He's not mean. He's patient. He lifts us up when we fall. God is unmatched in his care, amen? When we think of the word pity, our minds can go a few different directions. Maybe your mind goes to the famous statement of Mr. T, I pity the fool, I don't know. Or maybe your mind thinks of seeing someone less fortunate on the street and having pity for them. In verse 13, David says the Lord shows compassion. compassion. God doesn't just see our need, he doesn't just see it and have pity for us. No, he shows compassion. He comes to us. He takes action. He moves to us in our need, and he has a solution and a way to help that need. Even when God disciplines us as his covenant children, he does so tenderly. His discipline is with care, and his discipline is on purpose. Hebrews chapter 12 is a great chapter to study, verses 4 to 11 on the discipline of God on his covenant children. God's discipline that he gives to his covenant children is not because he's vengeful or angry or wants to somehow punish you, but he does so with tenderness and he does it tenderly, trying to grow you and help you learn and understand to develop you more into what he's chosen you to be and what he's called you out to be, to be blameless and holy. He's bringing you into the image of Christ. Therefore, even in his discipline, he does it with compassion. He shows tenderness. He shows compassion by bringing people into our lives at just the time we need them. Godly, faithful friends, amen? God shows compassion through the spirit of God speaking to us when we need it most. When that still small voice speaks to us when our souls are famished. God shows compassion by healing us when our physical bodies need it and our souls are at their lowest point. And at the end of, of verse 13, David uses the words to those who fear him. In verse 13, as the father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. David, at the beginning of verse 13, 
shows our relational connection to God by using the word children. Then at the end of verse 13, he ties the beginning of the verse to the end, and he says the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Now the word fear here is not talking about being scared of God, not dreading a tyrant. The picture is the healthy fear of a child toward their parents. It's, it's respectful. It's, it's fearing God is, is being in awe of God. It's having, a, it's having a high view of God, being respectful of God, like a, like a parent that loves their children, not there, to, not there to hurt their child, but help their child. We know that God loves us and is actively working in our lives to become what he has called us to be. And those who have placed their confidence in Jesus the Christ have a respect for and a reverence for their heavenly father, and God shows compassion to his children. Maybe you're in this room today, and you had parents, maybe a father or a mother, where it wasn't a great picture of a healthy relationship between a heavenly father and his child. And we understand because of sin, there is abuse, there is mistreatment, there's hardship that comes into child-parent relationships. My friend, may I encourage you, God is the perfect father. God is the blameless father. God is a father where he cares, he is tender, he loves, he shows grace, he shows mercy. He doesn't want you to be scared of him, but because God is so great, because he is God, there's this awe of God, there's this respect for God, there's this reverence for God. And then he continues in verse 14. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. Aren't you glad that God cares for me knowingly? God knows me fully, and he takes care of me faithfully. And God cares for me faithfully. He knows everything about me. He, he knows our frame. How does he know our frame? Because he made you. The very first human ever made was Adam in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. That's where that last part of verse 14 says, he remembers that we are dust. He made Adam out of the, the dust of the ground and then Eve from a rib of Adam's side. He made first man from, from dust though. He, he formed Adam. In Psalms chapter 139 verse 15, in the secret place, we were knit together. In the secret place before, I believe that, that placement of even in the womb, God was already knitting you. Jeremiah 1.1 1, 1 says that work begins to happen, continues to happen in the womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were even formed in the womb, before you got your fingerprint and your facial expressions and the development of the body, as young as six, seven, eight weeks along in the womb, God has already formed you before that time even happened. Luke chapter 12, verse seven, the hairs of your head are all numbered by God. I always joke when I say that for some of you, the lack thereof, the hairs of your head, regardless of what number they are, God knows them, amen? The hairs of your head are numbered. In Psalms chapter 56, verse eight, it says, you have kept, David's here says in Psalms 56, eight, you have kept count of my tossings, talking to God. The tossings and the turnings and the turmoil of the, the agony and the anxiety and the worry and the frustration. God keeps count of those tossings in your life. And then he continues, he puts my tears in a bottle. Are they not in your book? What is David saying in Psalms chapter 56? God is fully aware of your pain and your hurt and your anguish and your, and your darkest times of your life. God is fully aware of all of it and he cares for you faithfully. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He formed the first human and he has precisely and knowingly put together each human who ever has been born. He knows everything about you in your creation and in your life. Things that you don't even know about you, God knows about you. He knows everything about you, and yet he cares for you faithfully. He never changes. He's aware, and he is all-knowing. Therefore, God's care for me fuels my praise for him. No matter what we want to try to hide from God, he sees it already. And you know what? He knows you and he cares for you faithfully. I think that's a God of worthy of being praised. That's a God of worthy of being worshiped. And when we gather as a church family and we, we come together in corporate worship, 
We're not gathering around an emotion or around a band. We're gathering around theological truth written down in lyrics, declaring these back to the presence of God, reminding ourselves of who God is, of who we are. We are praising God with our lungs. But it doesn't stop there. As we leave these walls of this building, we praise him with our lives as we live on mission for King Jesus. Because he is worthy of that. His care for me fuels my praise for him. See, it's not the other way around. And religion messes this up. It's not when I praise him, somehow now I get his care. No, it's his care fuels my praise. It's not the other way around. And oftentimes, like, well, I'll get God's attention if I do enough for him. My friend, listen to me. God's attention is on you. He gave it to you in Jesus Christ. He's given you a way. His love is right there. His mercy is right there. Full acceptance is there. It is now God's grace and God's mercy that now fuels us to live lives of praise with our lungs and with our actions for him as we live on mission. So may we be a people that let the weight of God's care fuel my praise for him because all other weights will run dry. You could try to motivate yourself to do good. I'm gonna try to pump myself up to praise God today. That will fail you because the caffeine will wear off at about 10 a.m., okay? And now you'll have no more caffeine. But the care of God will not wear off. That's why our praise cannot be connected to circumstances. Our praise needs to be connected to theological truths about who God is. And when that is the case, it will fuel our praise for him. So what's our learn to live? We like to learn to live here. We don't want to just learn to get knowledge. We want to learn to put some action to it as we go out on mission this week. I want to got three questions for you as we do every week. Three questions. Here we are. Number one, why do I praise God? Why do I praise God? As I said a second ago, if your reason to praise God is to somehow get him to love you more, my friend lives and tell you something, his love is 100% found in Jesus Christ. God is not impressed with us. We don't somehow earn anything from God because we praise him loud enough. We don't somehow earn anything from God because we praise him with our lives God's love is free. It's found in the work of Jesus Christ, amen? It's 100% grace. If you have to do anything for it, then it's not grace. It's a free gift. Jesus came down for you. He loves you. He shed his blood for you. He paid the price for you on the cross. And if you will come to him by faith, Put off your own works. Put off your own righteous acts trying to somehow impress God or get to God. Accept Jesus. In that moment, you are fully embraced by the Father as you accept the full gift of the gospel in Jesus Christ. Put faith in that. And from that, let your praise be fueled. If you're letting God's care fuel your praise, it'll be a lot louder praise. If you're letting anything else fuel your praise, it's going to be praise that is timid and dies off. Number two, what life events are hindering me from praising God? If we're honest this morning, all of us have life events that come into our life that make our praise a little harder for God. There are days where there are valleys. There are seasons where there are valleys. And I think oftentimes, instead of saying, why are these hindering me from praising God? I think we've got to rephrase that. What life events need to be interpreted through his care? Like what is God actively doing in some events of your life that you may be looking at as circumstantial hardships, but what if they're divine works of God's care in your life right now? What if that thing that you want so bad or that sickness you got right now or that infirmity you're walking through or that mistreatment you felt or whatever you have experienced this last week or this last month or this last year, what if that is God's care working in your life for something better for you? What life events are hindering me from praising God? Don't let circumstances steal your praise from God. Number three, number three. How can I share God's heart in my circle of influence? God has placed all of us in a circle of influence. And as we already said, God's heart is that he cares for the hurting. 
And so we must ask ourselves, where in our circle of influence can we show the heart of God? Where, there, where is there areas of our life where there is oppression? Where are there areas of our life where there is people that are hurting? Where are there people that are marginalized? Where are there mistreatments going on around us all the way from the womb to the tomb? Where can we have the eyes and the heart of God where we bring his hands and his feet into our neighborhoods and into our city and we care like the heart of God cares? How can I share God's heart in my circle of influence? God has given you an area of influence. Use it and steward it well, family. You have a stewardship of those relationships, of that neighborhood, of that workplace. And I pray that we would be Christians that live on mission, that share God's heart in our circles of influences. Amen? And may God go before us as we do. We're going to pray together. We're going to worship one more time. I've enjoyed studying God's word with you today. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your goodness and grace. We thank you for the gift of the gospel.